So um, today, today it's just you and me, Bamzi, and we're going to be going through. We, last time we studied John chapter one verses one through five, and we'll do a little bit of review on that, and then we're going to get hopefully from verses six through eleven. I did a little bit on twelve in the other session, and then we're we're not going to touch thirteen. Thirteen is going to be in the deep weeds. We're we're going to get into that more next week so that we can have some more time to get into that. Um, but before we dive in, how about I pray, and then we'll start reading the Word. Dear Heavenly Father, you are an awesome and sovereign God. You ordain all things that come to pass, and you work actively in history. And this is one of those moments. This, this time for us to share important things, for us to talk about spiritual things, not temporal things, for us to spend time in your word, which has the power to save, is ordained and blessed by you. I thank you for making us a part of that, and I pray that you would clear our minds this morning. I pray that you would open our eyes and our hearts so that we can understand and receive the things that you teach in your word, that in it we would know who Christ is and who we are and what our response to him should be. And I pray these things in his name. Amen. All right, so let's start off just by reading. And there's just two of us. So how about you read verses 1 through... Mm -hmm. 13, and then I'll read 14 through 18. We're still in the prologue of John, the first 18 verses, and uh, we might get one more lesson out of the prologue. Okay. Maybe two. Uh, but if you'll read 1 became, through 13, I'll read 14 and 18 through 18. Okay. The Word became flesh. Right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, all things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave, he gave the right to become children of God who were born, not of blood, nor of will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Very good. In verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So we're studying through the book of John here. And if we think back to last week's lesson, I did a little bit of an intro on who is John and where is John in the Bible? So can you remember, Ramsey, which books of the Bible of the New Testament were written by the John who wrote the Gospel of John? Which books of the Bible? Mm -hmm. So we've got the Gospel of John. Right. He wrote that one. And if we look at our, if we looked at all of the, the books in the Bible, we've got the Gospels, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I put an extra E in there. Oops. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. After John comes the book of Acts, which is the Acts of the Apostles after Jesus' ascension back to heaven. Then we've got the Pauline epistles. These were the letters written by the Apostle Paul to 
um, the churches that he had started around um, in that area. The first is Romans, which is sort of like his magnum opus. It's the largest of Paul's letters. And then the smallest one is way over here, Philemon. I'll just shorten that to Phil. And these are all ordered from largest to smallest. That's just how they decided to order them. They could have ordered them chronologically or alphabetically. They ordered them by size. So if you were to stack them all, if you had them all as individual books and you set them on the bookshelf, it'd be thick to really thin. And then after Paul's epistles, we've got the book of Hebrews. Hebrews was a letter written by an author, and we don't know his name, but the writing style and a lot of the doctrine in the book of Hebrews is similar to Paul's, so we stick it over next to Paul's. But if we're being honest, we have to say, we just have to refer to him as the author of Hebrews. After Hebrews comes James. James was one of the half-brothers of Jesus, who during his earthly ministry did not believe that he was the Christ. It was only after he died and was raised um, that he believed that he was the Messiah. After James comes the Petrine epistles, because they were written by Peter. Peter. So we've got one, two, Peter. And then we've got the Johannine epistles. And this we usually refer to, you should say, one, first, second, or third John. Now, if you're across the pond, if you're over in England, a lot of times they won't say first, second, or third. They say one, two, or three. So if you're ever watching anybody on YouTube at preaching conference or whatever, and they've got a British accent, they'll say one John or two John. And that, so that sometimes I say one, two, three John just to make my wife laugh. And then um, after, after John's epistles, we have Jude. And Jude is a little bitty book, just like Philemon. And it's, it's one chapter, so we don't even include the chapter when we refer to Jude. We just say Jude and then the verse. And then after Jude is the book of Revelation. This was also written by John. This was when Jesus appeared to him in a vision on the Isle of Patmos. John at that point in his life was in exile on an island. And um, while he was there, he received this revelation. Sometimes you'll see this referred to as the apocalypse. And apocalypse is not what we usually hear of in movies where we think of it as a big end time event. There are end time events that will happen, but the word in Greek apocalypse just means revelation. So it doesn't mean the world is ending. We just associate it with that because in the book of Revelation, there's a lot of end time prophecy. It's an entire book of prophecy. So the books that John wrote, the John that wrote the Gospel of John, are the Gospel of John, one, two, three John, which are these epistles to the churches that he uh, had taught in the past, and the book of Revelation. So there's five books that John wrote in the New Testament, which other than Paul makes him one of the most prolific writers in the New Testament. Peter wrote two, Luke wrote two, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. And at our church, we've just started studying Acts, or that sort of preacher is preaching through the book of Acts. But you could almost consider Acts to be like second Luke, because he, Luke, when he writes, he addresses the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts to the same guy. He's like, written, he's gathered all this research and he's writing this Gospel to a man named Theophilus. We don't even know who he is. And then he addresses the same Theophilus at the beginning of the book of Acts. So let's see, I'm going to erase some of these things. So that's where John is in the New Testament. There we go. Let's erase this. Now, what do we know about John? Is this John the same John as the one we call John the Baptist? Do you know? No, it's not. And part of uh, a hint for why we know that is John the evangelist, and I'm going to say evangelist because he, he wrote this gospel as, as a means to evangelize, as a means to, to get the gospel out there so that people can know it and understand it and believe, that, um, believe in, in the name of Jesus. John the evangelist um, is not John the Baptist, but we're going to start talking about John the Baptist today. He has an important role in the beginning of Christ's ministry, and he was actually... John the Evangelist was a cousin of Jesus. Some, some, some commentators will say he's a nephew of Jesus. I, that it just depends on how they follow his um, uh, family tree. John the Baptist was a cousin of Jesus. And when Mary, the mother of Jesus, went to visit her relative, Elizabeth, 
Elizabeth had already been pregnant with John the Baptist for six months. And so she was well along. And when Mary told Elizabeth that she was going to have Jesus and told her all about how he was conceived and things like that, John, unborn child, in his mother's womb, leapt for joy. That's what the Bible says. He leapt for joy. It wasn't like a little kick, oh, that's cute, you know, feel my tummy kind of thing. No, he leapt for joy um, because even in the womb, he was already called to a specific purpose. He, he was already um, uh, aware of these things, which is sort of mind boggling because usually we think of somebody who um, is saved, who is converted as having heard the gospel and understood it, which means you have to get to a certain point in development to be able to hear and understand the gospel. Um, but John was saved in the womb. He was converted in the womb, filled with the spirit and already commissioned to take on this role. And these two guys, they were, as a result, were related. But John the Evangelist was also a disciple of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a pre, pre-runner. If we look in, um, if, you've, if you're in John chapter 1, if you will look, I tell you what, let's just go ahead and start with verse 6, because that's who we're talking about here in verse 6. It says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John, and that's John the Baptist here. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. So here it says that he was sent from God, and by this we know that he was a prophet. We could say that he's the last of the Old Testament prophets. Now, What's the difference between a prophet and a priest? A priest is somebody who brings the sacrifices and cares and prayers and concerns of the people to God. A prophet is somebody who brings the words of God to the people. So he was sent by God to preach a certain message. And his role as the last Old Testament prophet, so to speak, was to turn the hearts of the people of Israel back to God in preparation for the coming of Christ. He preached repentance. He preached um, a return to understanding and following the law. He said, turn and repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And he, he, he was a weird guy. Do, do you know much about John the Baptist? No. Okay. I heard kind of references to him as he's a, what do you say, um, or do you call, he's fanatical or I'm not sure if that's the right word, but you know what? I, there were a lot of people who probably thought that. Okay. Especially some that were in the ruling class of the, of the Jewish temple at the time. Um, he, he, when I say he was a weird guy, get this picture in your mind. I'm going to draw it. This is our first stick figure of the day. Okay. Here's John the Baptist. He wore, um, like leather clothes and fur clothes and he wore a, a, a leather belt and he let his hair grow wild and he looked kind of scraggly and he lived out by the Jordan River, out in the wilderness all the time. And he would eat locusts and honey. So let's see if I can, here's a honeycomb, all right, dripping with honey. And then he also ate locusts, which are kind of like grasshoppers. Let's see if I can do that if I could do that justice here. All right. He ate locusts and honey. And, and he was just out there crying for people to repent. And people came in droves to hear him speak and to be baptized by him in the Jordan River. And so he, he baptized with water. And you'll see some references in other parts of the scripture to John's baptism versus, excuse me, Jesus' baptism or baptism by the Holy Spirit, or baptism by, by fire, all, or all sorts of concepts. But he came baptizing. That's why we call him John the Baptist or John the Baptizer. He's not the first Southern Baptist. Like, that's, like as, a, as a denomination in, <laughs> in the church, he's not the first Southern Baptist. He, he was, like, I'll, I'll go ahead and write that here. He was John, a lot of people call him John the Baptizer because he came baptizing and calling people to repent. And this word to baptize means to immerse, 
to dunk in the water, to go all the way under. And it wasn't uh, a means by which your sins were cleansed. Baptism does not wash away your sins. Baptism does not actually confer grace upon you. Baptism is, I mean, like when I get in the bathtub, it's, that's sort of the same thing as getting baptized every day. So that doesn't actually wash away my sins. But what it is, is a sign of going into the water and coming out is a declaration of what's already happened inside you. When he was calling people to repent, they were going in and being baptized as a sign of, yes, I'm repenting. This is what I'm doing. And I want the world to know it. And that's what he did. And people came in droves. And this bothered the Pharisees. This bothered a lot of people. John the baptizer was eventually beheaded. Um, he, like any good preacher, knows that when you see falsehood, you speak against it, not as a means to stir up trouble or to tell people that they're bad people or condemn them. Those are all things that belong to God. It's God's job to judge and to condemn. Our job is to only speak truth. And so he spoke truth against the wrong people, and they beheaded him for it. And we'll... We'll get into that at another point. But if we look back here now, now that we get a little bit of a brief understanding of who John is, in verse 7, it uses this word, he came as a witness. Now, this is a legal term. This is as if you went to stand, you were called up to the witness stand in a courtroom. And they were to say, you know, you, you put your hand on the Bible and raise your hand and say, you know, I'm going to swear to tell the truth, so help me God. He came to bear witness to build up a case for who Christ is. He was to bear witness about the light. And this light is referring to Christ. Remember, we, we, we talked in a previous verse in verse 4. In him was life, and life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not overcome it. That's in reference to Christ. And he came to bear witness of who Christ is. He's, his job is not just to turn Israel back to God, but it's to point them ultimately to Jesus, to point them to Jesus. And in that sense, he has a very evangelistic role. And we see him portrayed more in his evangelistic role in the Gospel of John than in the other Gospels. He has more of a, um, uh, is, he's more of a preacher against sin and for repentance. But John the evangelist, as a disciple of John, the thing he saw him the most as is being the guy who brought him to Christ. That John the baptizer is the guy who said, look to him, there goes the Lamb of God. That's who you need to be following. And so, um, and we'll, we'll get into that some more because that's, there's a lot of description of that process later in chapter one in the book of John. But this word witness, I want us to pay attention because John the evangelist who wrote this gospel is building up a case for Christ. The, the, the further we go in this gospel, especially starting in chapter 2, we're going to see the first of seven signs. I'll write the word signs here. The first of seven signs. Oops, it's behind me. Seven signs that Jesus performed that John is using to explain who Christ is. He's building up a legal case to say, this is who Christ is, because he did these things, was able to do this, this is how we understand that he is God, that he has power over all of these things, that he is the only name under heaven by which we may be saved. And so it's almost like a legal case. And one of the words we use for that is an apologetic. An apologetic is not to say, um, I'm sorry. An apology is to say, um, these are the reasons for why I believe what I believe. This is why I understand uh, how what I believe works. This is an apologetic for him, a case for who Christ is, and that because of who Christ is, you, you need to believe in him. He's got a purpose here in writing this. You must believe in order to be saved. And so both of them in that sense have that purpose. John the Baptist came to be a witness, to bear witness about the light. And now John is writing this entire gospel for that same purpose. Now, in verse 8, it says he was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. And there's some details about that in um, just a few verses ahead. And I'd like for us to read those. I need more pixels here. Whoa. 
Whoa, that's a big eraser. Okay. So if you'll scroll down with me to verse 19, let's read verses 19 through 23. Can you read those verses for me? The testimony of John the Baptist. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed. I am not the Christ. And they asked me, and they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, no. So they said to him, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make it straight the way of the Lord. As a prophet Isaiah said. Very good. So here he says, I'm not the light. And people came and actually asked him that. Specifically, the Jews sent messengers to him and said, who are you? I mean, we, we know that you're doing all these things and people are coming to you in droves, but who are you? And he confessed, I am not the Christ. I am not the Messiah. Now he's using a very specific word there. When he says the word Christ in the Greek, this is, uh, I'm going to do my very best to do this in Greek. Um, Christos, which is probably like that. Okay. This word is the same word that in Hebrew is called Messiah. Christ in Greek is Christos or Christ. In Hebrew, the word is Messiah. They both mean the same thing. They both mean anointed. Now, the word anointed refers to anointing the head with oil. It was uh, an act uh, as a part of an official ceremony for three very specific roles in Jewish society. Um, there were three roles for which their heads were anointed. One was kings. The king's head was anointed when he was proclaimed king over Israel. Also, a priest's head was anointed when they were ordained as a priest. And a prophet's head was anointed as a sign that they were sent from God in order to proclaim the words of God. And so prophet, priest, and king is all rolled up in this idea of who the Messiah is. Now, at this time, the, the general understanding of what the Messiah should be and what the Messiah was going to be, the Jews were looking for the Messiah. They were waiting for the Messiah. But their understanding was not an eternal perspective on who the Messiah was. They thought that the Messiah was going to come to free them from their Roman oppressors. At this time, the Israelite nation was under the entire Roman Empire. They were a part of that. And so we'll see some names as we go through the Gospel of John referring to Roman rulers of the area. And they were allowed to keep um, sort of a self-governing body in the Jewish church, but they didn't actually have authority over their people. They sort of have authority over a subset of issues. And they were looking for somebody who God would send to lead the people in sort of like a freedom thing and restore the nation of Israel geographically, that they would be a sovereign nation once again. But that's not what Jesus came as. Jesus came as a man who was intended to be a, a mediator of what we call the new covenant. And this was, uh, when we talk about a covenant, this is a promise, a relationship, a contract cut between God and his people to define how we relate. When Jesus came to mediate between us and the Father, it was solely on the basis of our separation from him caused by sin. Not to come as a temporal, short time, I freed you from the Roman people and now you're a sovereign nation again. And so when they came to him and asked, John, are you the Christ? And he said, no, I'm not the Christ. He knows what he's talking about because God's already told him what the Messiah is intended to come for. They're coming to him asking him, are you the Christ? Are you this guy who's going to come free us from the Romans? So there's a disconnect in their understanding in that question. Now, in verse 21, they say, what then? Are you Elijah? Elijah is one of the um, most powerful prophets 
that did some of the most powerful miracles in the Old Testament. And he says, no, I, I'm not Elijah. And they say, are you the prophet? Now that prophet, when they say the prophet, they're referring to Moses. Okay. The prophet, that's an H, is Moses. Moses was the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. Moses is credited with writing the first five books uh, of the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy were all written by Moses. Um, he was the man who rescued the Israelites and led them to freedom out of Egypt, from bondage in Egypt. And at this point in time, there were millions of Israelites. So he led a, not just a few people out of Egypt, he led an entire like subset nation of Egypt out of Egypt as slaves. Um, they crossed over the Red Sea, they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 years until an entire generation died out. And then they were headed for the promised land, but because of some um, things God told Moses to do and he failed to do them, God said, your punishment will be that you don't get to enter the promised land. But it's still through Moses that while they were in the wilderness, uh, God gave the law, the law as recorded in those first five books, and especially as summarized in the Ten Commandments. You've probably heard of the word, the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Okay. Another word for the Ten Commandments is um, sometimes if, as you read commentaries, you'll see the word decalogue. This is just Greek. Deca meaning 10 and log logos meaning words, the 10 words referring to the 10 commandments. So when they say the prophet, they're talking about Moses. This is the guy who brought them the, the lion's share of their understanding of what the relationship should be with God. And he says, no. Now notice what he's asked. Are, they've asked him, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? Are you coming to free us? And he says, no. And they go, well, are you these two guys that died a long time ago and now you've been reincarnated? Okay. That's couched in that question there, that they believe that it's possible for this, I, this thing called reincarnation, which is taught nowhere in scripture. So this is extra biblical. This is their traditions adding on, their superstitions adding on to what's actually given as truth in scripture. And he says, no. He says, but I am the, one, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. His job was to come before Christ to sort of straighten the roads out. As kings in those days traveled, they traveled over, I mean, we have paved highways everywhere now, but back then it was all open roads. And there would be a team of people whose job was to go out ahead of the king and flatten it, get rid of the rocks, get rid of the bumps, get rid of the potholes so that the king could travel safely and securely and quickly over uh, undeveloped terrain. And that's the picture he wants us to see of his role to Christ. Christ is coming, um, and he wants to prepare that way, prepare the hearts of the people as he comes in. So now let's flip back to verse 9. John begins to make a point about Christ and his relationship to the world. And he says in verse 9, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Now, he gives light to everyone in the world. If we read that wrong, if we read that out of context, we can land on a very bad conclusion. If he gives light to everyone, and our, our understanding, as we studied last week, was that light means divine understanding of truth, um, that kind of sounds like he saves everybody, which is not true. Many people reject Christ. Many, many, I would go with most people reject Christ. And so if he gives light to everyone, how can we say that that's true? But we get a little hint of that. He was in the world, the world was made through him, and yet the world did not know him. Paul gives a little bit longer explanation of this in the book of Romans. So keep a finger in John, and as you flip to the right, after John, we have Acts and then Romans, is the two, just two books over. And I want us to look at Romans chapter one. In Romans chapter one, there's sort of a prologue, just like in John, where Paul explains who he is, what his role is as an apostle, how much he longs to come to Rome 
to teach the Romans and to be mutually, to mutually benefit uh, from learning from them. And then he kicks off his description of the gospel, his case for the gospel in verse 16. But we're going to start reading in verse 18. Are you, are you with me? You, you got verse 18 there? Yeah. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18. And I'll start reading, uh, and you just read along. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. So here, back in, John, back in John, when it says that he gives light to everyone, we also knew from John chapter 1 and verse 3 that Jesus is the creator. He is the uncreated creator of all things. And here in Romans, it says that one of the purposes for the creation that he made was so that we could see it, and by seeing it, look to God, that we would see his eternal power and his divine attributes reflected and displayed by everything that's been made. If you look at the intricate details of the human body or the amazing beauty of the stars and nebula and cosmos in the sky, if you look at the interactions of animals that, that are very clearly designed, not accidentally developed, we see evidences of a designer. When we talk about Jesus as creator, we often refer to animals as creatures. This root word is the same. When we say the word creature, we're saying this is something that's been created. Yeah. And so all of the things that have been made are given so that we might understand that God exists. We call this revelation through creation. We call this general revelation. General revelation is given so that we might know that God exists and see evidences of him. However, as we, as we just read in Romans, this, this general revelation does not lead to a saving knowledge of God, a faith in who he is as a personal God that we have a relationship with through Christ. Now, the things, the evidence of that is called special revelation, and that's given here in Scripture. So if you ever hear me refer to special revelation, this is God speaking specifically through men who have written down the, the words of God, and it's compiled in this format so that we can know and understand these things. So uh, Christ came to give light to everyone coming into the world. He was in the world, and it was made through him. I'm back in John, by the way. Flip back to John and yet the world did not know him. And in verse 11, he came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. Now, who is he referring to by his own people? You got a guess? Um, I'm guessing the Jews. You're guessing correctly, okay? okay. Now, that sounds kind of selfish or, or elitist maybe, but it's consistent with what's in scripture. If you keep a finger in John, let's flip back to one of the first books in the Bible. We've got just a minute here. We'll close with this. Flip with me to Exodus. The book of Exodus is the second book in the Bible, right after Genesis. Exodus chapter 19. Exodus chapter 19. Do you have Exodus chapter 19? Yeah. Good. All right. So at this point, Israel has been um, rescued, redeemed out of Israel. They've been brought out of slavery and I'm sorry, out of Egypt by Moses. 
and they've crossed over the Red Sea, they're in the wilderness, and they go to a mountain called Mount Sinai. And this is where, um, am I in the right place? Yes, this is where Moses begins to describe for the people and lay out the law that God has given him on the mountain. And so it says in verse um, three, I'm going to read, start reading the second half of verse 3. The Lord called out to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shall you say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel. By the way, the name Israel is, um, is, is the name given by God to a man named Jacob. So if anytime we see Jacob, Jacob, this is also Israel. And he, it's by his name that the, that the nation of Israel is called. So when it says the house of Jacob and the people of Israel, that's the same thing. In verse 4, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. Now, he, he's choosing them not because they're special. He's choosing them not because there's a lot of them or that they're the largest nation. If you will now flip with me, there's a book called Deuteronomy. So after Exodus is Numbers. No, after Exodus is Leviticus, then Numbers, then Deuteronomy. So not very far forward in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy... Um, in that book, we start to see a repeat, a, a re-recitation, so to speak, of the law of Moses. And Moses is, is describing these things to turn the people back and to, to make them remember the things that he told them on Mount Sinai. And let's start reading. If you, do you have Deuteronomy chapter 7? Okay. Yeah. I'm going to start reading in verse 6. Just follow along with me. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keeps his commandments to a thousand generations. So why does God choose the Jewish people to be his people? For one reason, because he wants to. He brings them out of Egypt so that he can begin to work in their nation as a light unto the other nations that it's through their, their nation that all nations of the earth will be blessed. This is the promise that he makes to their father, Abraham. And he begins to give them the special revelation that we talked about a few minutes ago that is captured in the Old Testament. If we're reading the Old Testament, we're reading the words of God given through the Jewish nation. And so Jesus came as a Jew. He was born into a Jewish family in the line of one of the greatest Jew, uh, kings of Israel, King David. He came through the Davidic line. He came as a uh, fulfillment of the promise God made that there would always be a king of David on the throne. The fulfillment of that is Christ, who is king forevermore in heaven, reigning over all the world as the king of kings. And so he came as a Jew, and his ministry was primarily to the Jewish people, and yet as a nation, they rejected him. Now, we're going to finish here, but we'll continue next week looking in verse 12, because we see the world's rejected him, even the Jewish nation as a whole has rejected him, but in verse 12, we get into, but to all who did receive him, and now we're getting into the good news. We've talked about the bad news the God, word gospel means good news, but you can't talk about the good news before you understand the bad. So we're going to get into the good news starting in verse 12, and it's going to just keep getting better and better from there.
Okay. Yeah. Sweet. Sounds questions? Good. You got questions? Um, no, I mean, not yet. I, uh, I'm not really clear about how Old Testament and New Testament works and, you know, yeah, I'm basically like, zero ideas yeah. about that yeah so yeah so you'll probably have to like help me understand what is the old testament and how much gap is there between old and new mm -hmm. and stuff like that so yeah i mean it, it doesn't have to be now whenever you have time you know absolutely uh, I actually kind of like that, that that it's just you and me on mondays um at least for now this is great because i know that um, different people are coming into this from different places and they've got different backgrounds and understandings. I've got some people who may have been in church their whole life. I've got some people that have told me that, that have already told me this is only the fourth time I've ever opened the Bible. So you should know you're not alone in that. Okay. okay. You're coming into this Bible study at the same level as some of the other people. Um, and so don't be afraid to raise your hand and go, wait, you lost me. Okay. Uh, I don't know who John the Baptist is and you're pretending like we all do. So just stop and explain that for a minute because I totally want to do that. Okay. Um, that's going to help us. We're, we're going to be able to progress further if we take some time to talk about some of these foundational ideas. That's going to help us progress further as we go along. So that's not slowing us down at all. Yeah. Cool. I always wanted to learn more about John the Baptist anyway, so. Yeah, we started yeah. at a good place. <laughs> yeah, sure. We, you'll, you'll get um, more details about John the Baptist's ministry and things that he did in some of the other Gospels, some of the first three Gospels. Um, and you can, it, if, if, you, if you look at those, that, he's always towards the beginning of the Gospels. So if you start flipping through one of them, because he, he was early in Jesus' ministry as a, as a front runner. So you can read some of those. If you want, next time I come, um, I can, I can, or I can just send you later on some references to read up on what John the Baptist did and some of the other gospels. I, if you'd like, I can do that. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Well, That's before we yeah. go, how about I close in prayer and then, uh, then we'll get to work. Cool. Sure. All right. Dear Lord, we thank you. Any time that we spend in your word is precious time. And I know that you've written it for a purpose. And I know that it always goes out and accomplishes the thing that you've purposed it for. That in the words of scripture is the gospel that has the power to save. It has the power to take dead hearts and transform them to living hearts. It has the power to take uh, rebellious people and turn them into children of God. It has the power to transform marriages and families, work relationships, and ultimately to bring sinners to you so that they can be face-to-face -face with you for eternity. I thank you, Lord, for this time, and I pray that you give us many, many more times just like this. In Christ's name, amen. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Ramsey. That was nice. That was... A good start to the week. That's good. one one other reason why I like the Monday ones. <laughs> Excellent. Cool. Well, have a good day. I'll see you. Too. Bye. Talk to you Thanks. later. Bye. Have a nice day.